As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 161, Stalin Bio, Part 5, Battles Within Battles. Last time, in mid-1904, Kobov found himself back home in Gori, having been dismissed from his latest assignment at Batum, having lost what support he had from the other Marxists, having lost his sometime girlfriend, though only after giving her a good cursing, and having to use false identification papers, spending his days trying to stay one step ahead of the local authorities. But as Koba had established safe houses for others when he had left the seminary, he now was allowed to take advantage of such established by others, who still believed in his sincere Marxist thought. Kamenev, one of his peers, his real name was Lev Rosenfeld, helped him find his first hideaway. This was the apartment of one Sege Aluyev, a machinist who was now married and worked in Tiflis. Sergei's father's home, just outside of Gori, would find Koba there as well at times. And those times increased as the father would become, in time, Koba's future second father-in-law. And because Stalin still believed and was still determined to fight for the cause, his days of lecturing and inspiring the locals returned. Soon, the house outside of town had become a Marxist meeting place and more, that is, except by the more acceptable of the social democrats, who still saw Kobal as being on the outs. It would be here that Kamenev would hand over to Kobal a dog-eared copy of Machiavelli's The Prince, which the young man customarily consumed. After reading it, he shrugged, believing that the Italians did not have much to teach the Russians concerning political intrigue. Though it could not have possibly seemed so at the time to Koba, his and Lato's way of doing things, the direct, power-grabbing, agitating way, was coming into vogue. But not to give these two young men too much credit, much of this swing to action over thought simply came down to the noble's approach, like the literary Jordania, wasn't achieving results. No one's lives were getting better. That and the very oppressive system the czarist government was trying to keep in place was its own worst enemy. To prove this last point, the Marxists throughout Russia, certainly the various groups Koba associated with, had decided to step over the natural next aim of perhaps forming trade unions to help the workers, but would instead aim for the complete destruction of the current system. To be fair, the government under the Tsar knew the masses were unhappy, felt oppressed, were oppressed. But, like having a tiger by the tail, were too afraid to attempt any serious changes and would certainly not allow the people to instigate any. The peasants were still brutally worked and brutally treated. Any attempt at self-defense was severely crushed, as it was seen as treason. Stalin would write of this time, first one becomes convinced that existing conditions are wrong and unjust. Then Stalin would later explain, persuasively, then one resolves to do the best one can to remedy them. And he would continue to try to help the people, in the short term as well as into the future. Though the conditions of his existence were helping to shape him, the former student could not give up his self-appointed task to raise the people out of their ignorance. And though he had some success with the former goal, that is, taking on the establishment, the latter, dealing with the peasants' literacy, would always leave him frustrated. But what is fascinating about this man at this time in his life was that, as he obviously saw himself struggling against the authorities, 
He also saw himself as pitting his ideas of Marxism, as he understood it, against older, more established revolutionaries. Fortunately for him, he still had Lado on his side. Or rather, he was still on Lado's side, who still served as a role model. But that example of a young, fiery, anti-establishment mentorship was about to be removed permanently. And it probably came down to youth, but Koba couldn't help but see himself as the eventual winner against his peers and against the state. Another part was simply his personality. As noted by one of his peers at the time, Koba distinguished himself from all other Bolsheviks by his unquestionably greater energy, indefatigable capacity for hard work, unconquerable lust for power, and above all, his enormous, particularistic organizational talent. Though as capable as Jugashvili was, Laudo was easily his equal, if not his better, in stirring up revolution. After all, Laudo, who had Soso's passion, desire, and organizational skills, was also known as one of the most magnetic personalities of the Caucasus Socialist Movement. No one had, or has, accused the future Stalin of having an inner force that drew people towards him. However, dark times were about to come to Koba in the loss of his mentor. First, Lado's periodical Brazola stopped coming out in the spring of 1902, as many of those who gave it life were arrested. Before too long, Kitschkovili's periodical Cavalli would be closed down as well. Kitschkovili was arrested later that year, as was Lado, who, it seems, practically gave himself up by giving his real name when asked. Perhaps he was seeking a martyrdom for himself, or at least a chance to establish his bona fides with some jail time. Either way, due to his nature, he daily taunted the guards who bided their time waiting for an opportunity for payback. One day in August of 1903, Lotto, still in prison, was standing next to a window. The guard told him to come away. Lotto did not. The guard again ordered him away from the window. Lotto did not budge. The guard lifted up his gun and shot the 27-year-old, who died instantly. Much later, when Stalin was firmly in control of the entire state, though he would whitewash others' reputations, who knew him at the time, Lotto was not one of them. On the other hand, Lotto was killed before he could become a possible impediment to Koba's rise to power. Either way, Stalin's first mentor was gone. With the death of his friend and guide, Koba now desired revenge, as well as the fall of the Tsarist state and the rise of a social system that would actually consider the desires of the people. But that was the equivalent of moving a mountain. Tsar Alexander II and III, who ruled before Nicholas II of the time of World War I, truly desired the help of wise men, but weren't willing nor able to release any of their power. They feared the people they ruled and could never trust the elites they sought to help them with their tasks. So parliaments were attempted, but never lasted. Other advisory bodies rose, but then fell again, as the leader, whoever it was at the time, was unwilling to share power. So, as the nobility of the other European countries learned and got a chance to rule, The Russians were never allowed to have political parties or trade unions. Censorship was always present, which left one option for the oppressed, who sought change, assassination. By 1894, the attempts on the lives of the two Alexanders was beyond counting, as were the deaths of their main advisors, almost always family members. In response, Tsar Nicholas, when he came to power, chose to, instead of removing the reasons for the threat against him, perhaps by sharing power, reorganized the political police, thus creating the Okrana Ot Deleni. This entity, soon after called the Okranka, 
or the little security agency, was supposed to work with the regular police and the special corps of gendarmes to secure peace by removing any threats. But, as with so many things in Russia, that's not how it turned out. The Okranka started out, like their European counterparts, reading suspects' mail, even when written in invisible ink. They steamed open letters, and when they ran across some revolutionaries' codes, worked upon them until they were cracked, then allowed the letters to continue on. But here's where the system began to fail its political master, the Tsar. As many members of the Okranka were well-educated, they sought to outsmart the socialists at their own game. They, too, collected various illegal works to read them so they could undermine the writers' conclusions with their own periodicals. Collecting and burning books was all well and good, but if you could learn what your enemies believed, you could fight them on that level with misinformation. One would doubt the Tsar would have gone along with this passive way of fighting the socialists, but he never knew. Nicholas II did not like this agency, but was unable to scrap it because of its results. Yet what he did not know was that those very results were, at times, manufactured, or came at a high price. The Okranka would learn of a coming assassination, and instead of foiling it, would allow it to proceed, but then follow the killer, or killers, so they could catch more of the group. This worked well, and they were praised for their efforts, but an official was still dead, perhaps along with those who had the bad fortune to be near him at the time. Worse, at times, the Okranka would themselves assassinate minor officials to ensure job security. Soon, a minor undeclared civil war was rampant within the secret organization. The only good news was that this body used equally brilliant and ruthless tactics against the enemies of the state. If a revolutionary was discovered, rumors were put out that the man worked for the police as an informant. And just like that, the revolutionary was no longer trusted by his peers, thus was neutralized. Stalin would fight this kind of accusation his whole life, well, up until he was absolute master of Russia. But even after his death, he was accused of working for the authorities, though this has never been proved. So the Okranka was another entity the socialists had to deal with, but for all of the security agency's successes, genuine and self-made, it did not help Tsarist Russia deal any better with what caused so much tension, the government's ways, nor what was coming, a fundamental shift in how governments functioned. As the 20th century opened up, mass production and industrialization took on and took over more of the labor process. As such, life changed for the people, and companies and governments suddenly had access to astounding technology. Very quickly, a country was either modern or it was not. But the downside wasn't just a loss of prestige. It was weakness, economic and military weakness. And these two combined could allow any nation-state to be overpowered, to be reduced to a colony. The only questions that mattered was who had electric motors, mass production, the ability to make steel, and labor that had the ability to learn. Everything now came down to, was a country a user of raw materials, selling finished goods, or the provider of raw materials, selling what you had, only then to use those funds to buy the finished products. The true division of the more advanced countries versus the others started in earnest at this time. Which brings us back to Russia. Russia was no Germany or Japan with their rapid industrialization and wider education for the masses. But it was no Africa either. It was somewhere in between. But again, the question was, could you make farming equipment or rifles and artillery just as well and as fast as your neighbors? This required a yes or no 
there was no in-between. As for Russia's achievements in this now crucial race to industrialize, it had some success, but honestly, mostly due to its size, as in quantity over quality. Before World War I, it had the fifth largest industrial base, but was the number one food producer. The problem was the other statistics. Russia's per capita GDP was just 20% of Britain's and 40% of Germany's. Also, its life expectancy was less than Britain's and Germany's, somewhere on par with British India. As for literacy, the people of Russia were nowhere near their geographical neighbors, something that frustrated the future Stalin. And the Russian nobles knew this. But so, too, did the socialists. Suddenly, their enemy wasn't only the Tsar. It was every other country around them. Germany had recently unified, as had Italy, and Japan was industrializing at a staggering rate. Which one, or perhaps all three, would come to the Russian border with modern armies, highly trained officers, and well-supplied soldiers? One can't shout, wait, give me 30 years to catch up. That's not how the great game works. Marx had gotten it right as to the changes to society modernization would bring, but it also hampered the already hard road Russia would have to undertake in order to follow Marx's path of feudalism, capitalism, socialism, communism. The people weren't ready. The government wasn't ready. If things didn't change soon, large chunks of Russian land could be taken away by its various neighbors. Nicholas II, by 1905, felt enough pressure from his nobles, the socialists, and foreign countries, in the form of their more productive assemblies and assembly lines, to allow what became known as the Great Reforms. The Duma was promised, as well as some individual rights. But honestly, Nicholas's heart wasn't in it. He saw nothing wrong with autocracy and divine right monarchy. So this wave of reform, which was approved by Russian conservative, moderate, and liberal elements, was not to last. For one thing, as for the socialists, it didn't go far enough. Yet the Tsar thought he had gone too far, so tried to compensate by cracking down on the radicals. 260 members of the St. Petersburg Soviet were arrested, including Trotsky. Then union leaders and strike managers disappeared from the streets. But not forgetting the messengers, eight newspapers in Moscow were shut down. This extreme attack caused the Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, and other socialist revolutionaries to temporarily join forces, stockpiling weapons, blocking streets within the capital, and assassinating officials. This, to a degree, was what Nicholas had been hoping for. His enemies had come out of hiding. Sending in regular soldiers with artillery, more than 1,000 citizens were killed during a protest. Looking ahead, by 1907, Nicholas had manipulated the governmental processes to the point that all the recent reforms were meaningless. It must be noted that there had been other reforms equally lacking in success during the second half of the 1800s. But, as with all things... It came down to money. Due to the Crimean War and the follow-up revenge Russo-Ottoman War, 1877-78, the Russians lost the first and won the second. Yet it didn't matter. Wars, either victorious or not, cost money. By the 1880s, Russia's budget for military matters went from 1.7 billion rubles to 4.6. But somehow, amazingly, by the turn of the century, Russia had enough money for what it considered a moderately sized military. This, of course, was because of the tax system, most notably on alcohol, as the government had a monopoly. But truth be told, the Tsarist government did increase its expenditure on education to hopefully have a workforce, one day, comparable to the rest of Europe. Yet this completely backfired 
as students were the ones leading the strikes throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, again due to the type of government in St. Petersburg, a Russian catch-22, if you will. Soon the workers were following the students, striking and destroying their betters' estates. This, of course, meant a lower yield in food production, the country's ace. Yet Russia still fed much of Europe, as their grain exports were still massive. In the south, probably due to the vast distance from the Winter Palace, the Tsar's repressive ways drove the people to rebel openly. The peasants chased away the landowners, wrote up a list of demands, elected their own leaders, and armed as best as they could, waiting for Nicholas to react. The Georgian Social Democrats were caught off guard by this, but quickly met with the newly elected leaders and tried to take control of the situation, not trusting this movement to the unlearned. Yet the illiterates were doing well enough. They were able to get rents lowered, some freedom of speech, and the police were replaced by local autonomous guards. To be fair, the government during this time had other concerns. After the Crimean War, the Russians went over to an expansionist policy. Additional land was taken, and then more land was taken, to protect the formerly acquired land. Russia already had territory in the Far East, but trade was never developed due to limited transportation. Then came the Trans-Siberian Railroad, finished in 1903. But again, Russia's fear of China kept their development and further expansion precarious. Russia justified its acquisitions by saying, if we don't, some other European power would. So it might as well be us. Just like everyone else, Russia eyed China, or rather its resources. But by then, Japan was becoming more of a threat in the area, with its speedy industrialization and growing navy. Japan had already beat and humiliated China in battle to decide the fate of the Korean Peninsula in 1894-95. Suddenly, there was a new player in the Far East. But because of nothing more than racial arrogance, Nicholas could not let himself see the land of the rising sun as a serious threat. The two countries circled each other through negotiations. The main question was, who would control Manchuria and Korea? The Russian position was that, as Japan had already taken Korea, Russia should have the land to the immediate north. But conservative elements on both sides wanted both territories. Then Japan, deciding it was not being dealt with fairly, opted for a quick strike, sinking several Russian vessels at Port Arthur in February of 1904. St. Petersburg reacted by having its Baltic fleet sail 18,000 nautical miles to engage the Japanese. There, that fleet was then sent to the bottom of the ocean in May 1905. This combined with the Mukden victory for the Japanese, at the time the largest engagement in world history, some 624,000 combined soldiers, showed the Russian military and the Japanese military for their true worths. The people of Russia had had enough. Many people of St. Petersburg went on strike, thereby halting war production at a very inconvenient time and the people demanded changes. Next, they gathered in six massive groups throughout the city and marched on the Winter Palace. They were led by priests and chanted, God save the Tsar. Nicholas II did not meet with his people. He was not moved. Instead, he sent out the soldiers, who shot down hundreds of them, men, women, and children. Russian peasants everywhere raged against the government, in whatever form it was close to them, and refused to pay their taxes. Nicholas, in response, called up more men, hoping to suppress his own people and continue the battle with the Japanese. Ironically, though Japan had won the land battle, its smaller population would not let it replace their losses. So President Theodore Roosevelt was called upon by Japan 
to intercede, which led to a peace treaty. Russia acknowledged the loss, but did not have to pay an indemnity. Yet the Sakhalin Island, a penal colony at the time, was handed over to Japan. For the first time in history, an Asian power had defeated a European country. As can be expected, with St. Petersburg so engrossed, the revolutionaries like Stalin were temporarily forgotten and left alone, as in they were not sought after by the military recruiters of Nicholas. Almost everyone else, criminals of a non-political nature and those over 40, were asked to fight for the Tsar. As Kopa was currently out with the mainstream Social Democrats of Georgia, hiding from them as much as the police, his attitude, and his youth must be kept in mind here, was in for a kopeck, in for a ruble. From his various hiding holes, Jugashvili called for a standalone Georgia Social Democratic Workers' Party. This entity would work alongside the all-Russian Social Democrats, but would have its own bosses and its own agenda. One can easily see that, perhaps, this was his first step to obtaining a true leadership position. Creative fracas, split away the group within Georgia, and then fight for the top spot. But either due to his inexperience, age, or that it was simply a bad idea, the older, more established socialists around did not only not go for this, but pressured him to renounce this idea publicly. To them, there was no way a Georgian Social Democratic Party could survive. And if the revolution ever did come, they would all be on the outside, looking in. Stalin realized he had gone too far, so apologize and renounce he did, in writing in February of 1904. Yet the young, ambitious man still found a way to gain something as he voluntarily stepped back. Waiting a few months so his apology could circulate, Stalin found a newly established Paris-based magazine that basically strove for the same thing he talked about a separate Georgia, and then tore into them. Entitled, How Social Democracy Understands the National Question, the young intellectual wrote that it was obvious to anyone who knew Russia that the Social Democrats had to stay together. Either all of Russia changed, or none of it. Clearly, he scoffed, these faraway peoples did not understand Georgia, that they should focus on their own turf. This letter, entitled Credo, further got the young former seminarian out of hot water with his elders, who were now willing to give him another chance. Yes, Koba was back in, but still needed a lesson, so his elders believed, so sent him to Chiatura in western Georgia. Chiatura was a nowhere place, certainly not the area where an ambitious young man should be. But no one could know that the mining area was about to become one of the main fronts of the social democratic revolution. Chiatura had been a sleepy little town until the mid-1800s, until manganese was found there. Soon there were hundreds of little companies, each fiercely holding on to their plot, altogether paying some 3,700 miners and sorters to bring the substance out of the ground. By 1905, Chiatura was supplying half of the world's manganese consumption, which was used for making steel. By any standard, even Tsarist Russia, Chiatura was a miserable place to live and work. The people were paid a miserly 40 to 80 kopecks a day. The men brought the substance out of the ground. The women and children washed it, readying it for transport. The work was hard the pay pathetic, their food covered with manganese dust. Their health soon deteriorated. After several decades of this, the people rebelled. The company owners, making huge profits, reacted sharply and brought in imperial troops, along with right-wing vigilantes, who did not have to conform to what few rules there were about enemy treatment. 
And in the middle of all this was the 27-year-old, Koba. This is what he and Lado had been waiting for. There was no time for speeches or papers or committee meetings. This was war. The people were ready to fight back, and Koba, minus his now-dead mentor, was ready to lead. With his education and coming from the Georgia Socialist Democrats, it didn't take long for the future Stalin to be taken seriously. And now that he was, perhaps for the first time, his passion, drive, and desire to lead sprang into life. First, there was the war for the people's hearts and minds. Koba focused on the vigilantes, who had started calling themselves the Holy Brigades. They had to be seen as anything but holy if Stalin was to get the people to fight, physically fight them. So he started calling them the Black Hundreds. First, the color had negative connotations, and by using hundreds, he reminded the people that there certainly weren't an endless number of the enemy. Then he took what local social democratic groups there were and formed them into the Red Hundreds. Here again, the young agitator was manipulating the people. The color red was for the struggling revolution they all knew about, the struggle being for their betterment. And the hundreds was not only mocking the black hundreds, but as the people well knew, they certainly had more than a few hundred ready to fight. But as any agitator knows, certainly a ruthless one, Koba knew there would be times when more direct methods would be needed to win this contest, so radical toughs were brought in. The miners resisted the soldiers, the thugs clashed with the black hundreds. And though not yet thirty years old, Stalin worked the people into a frenzy, but methodically used them in the struggle. Each mine was now a front in the war. Loyalists from other social democratic factions were brought in, and during all this, Kobol had learned a thing or two about resistance. There was to be no throwing away of lives by marching them in the streets so they could be shot down. A certain amount of terror was to be used with their guerrilla tactics, orchestrated and controlled by Koba. This combination worked well. By December 1905, the Red Hundreds, with Stalin guiding them, controlled Chiatura. But as educated, as well-read as Kubo was, he was about to learn, painfully so, a new lesson. Though he had poured his entire being into this battle, when it came time to formally choose a leader, the miners chose not him, but another socialist, one no Ramishvili. It seems there were battles within battles. The young Ramishvili had helped the resistance as well, but never lost an opportunity to remind the people that he was with the Menshevik faction of the struggle, and it was the Mensheviks that had done more for the people than the Bolsheviks, which Stalin belonged to. For whatever reason, the people were swayed by this, though clearly Stalin had done more for this immediate group. Still, all's fair in love and war and politics. It's not known if Koba desired that Rimashvili should meet with some kind of accident. He certainly would not have said this out loud. But the young man had already seen the results of reaching too far. No, this contest had to be decided through proper channels. So he wrote to the Bolshevik leader, the exiled Vladimir Lenin. His letter did not waste time discussing the struggle against the imperial troops. He was seeking advice from Lenin on how to win the more important battle. In Lenin, Stalin would find a receptive audience. The older man believed, as his soon-to-be protege did, that the people had to be led, whether they wanted to be or not. Left to their own devices, they would probably cease the struggle if given minimal concessions. This struggle was about Russia, all of it, including the removal of the Tsar and all other enemies, Tsarist 
or social democrat. 